Mother? Yes. Mother, they're very interested in Oakland and San Francisco and the earthquake and fire and the things that you always tell Joy and everybody about when you were a young girl. And she was telling me this morning. So we date this. Have you dated this already? No, All right. Today's February 12, 1987. We're at 1233 Derby Street in Berkeley, and we're talking to Ella Fister, who was born Ella Marie Spanagel in San Francisco on the 2nd of June, 1889. I have to stop and think about it. Early on a Sunday morning. <laughs> okay. And uh, we, we, we talk a lot. We've, we've had a lot of fun with this, and she's always telling Joy something special. But yeah. she does have some interesting stories. All right, Mama, you remember what you were saying just a little bit. What do you remember about Oakland especially and then the earthquake? Uh -huh. Well, I remember, but I, uh, I know, remember about Oakland. My father was a baker, and he worked all night long. And, um, and, it was, and, then, um, we, uh, and then the afternoon, he would bake cake for the bakery. But on um, Tuesday, and Thursday, those were his days off. And he went out into the fresh air. And that helped, helped, helped uh, keep him healthy and wise. Uh, I remember my father taking me to Oakland. Uh -huh. And what I was particularly interested in was a bakery over there. I looked in that window and looked. And they made all kinds of different bakeries than we did in San Francisco. And that was very interesting to me. <laughs> uh, Oakland was a, just a one horse town. Uh -huh. Men would drive around in wagons, yeah, just a little tiny wagon uh, and one horse, and they would drive it. Uh -huh. And uh, and most of the time, they'd have a bale of hay on the back of their wagon. They went to town to buy the hay for their horse. And, uh, and that, uh, that's what I remember. It was a very small uh, town. It was large, but, but at the same time, it was a country town. How did you get there? Well, we took the Mission Street car and we rode to the ferry building. And then we took the ferry boat to Oakland and then we took a train, the 7th Street train, and I think we got off at 7th Street and we wandered around there. That was the heart of Oakland. What was that now, Broadway? San Pablo, do you remember? Yeah, well, I don't remember San pa uh, uh, Well, I do remember San Pablo. I remember Oakland, yeah. And uh, there used to be quite a dry goods store there. I kind of forgot its name. <laughs> was it Withorn Swan? The Withorn Swan was in existence. O'Connor Muffin? They were way down. I think on Piss Street and Broadway, somewhere like that. What about O'Connor Moffat? Do you remember no, that? No. That wasn't there. That was not in, in O'Connor. Uh-huh. Did you have your experience when uh -huh. uh -huh. you um, This store was gradually taken all over by the Emporium. And, and it was run by the Emporium in Oakland. Well, it would be Capwell, Sullivan, and Firth. Firth, yes. That, that uh -huh. may be it. Capwell, that Sullivan. That was the main store. Uh, the main uh, store then. That's the, that was the name. Uh -huh. And Capwell's was a ribbon and lace store when it opened, wasn't it? Sure. They sold dry goods? They sold dry ribbons, goods. ribbons, lace. Uh -huh. Patterns, uh -huh. crochet work, embroidery. That's it. Now, now let me think what you said. Capitals in Oakland, did they? Yes. Uh huh. Wasn't that called the Lace Company, or it was, they sold laces and ribbons when they first opened? Uh -huh. That I don't remember, because mm -hmm. I was quite young then. Uh -huh. Now, was this before the earthquake? 
You used to come over when you were a little girl. Yeah, my father was a baker, and he was a half to have fresh air. So he would go outside on the boat and get all that fresh air on the outside of the boat. And we'd take the train, and we always got off at 7th Street, I think it was, mm -hmm. and Broadway, and walked all around there and looked at all the bakeries. <laughs> That's what we did. She told me and, once. Um, there were wagons, uh, uh, just a, a small wagon driven by one man and um, I think one horse. <laughs> and they went all over Oakland and they delivered hay and stuff like that. That's what I remember. Oakland was just a, a small town. <laughs> this was before the fire because she oh, was yes, almost 17 is, when the fire, yeah, uh -huh. earthquake and fire. Yes, happened. this was before the fire. Okay. What do you remember about, do you remember the earthquake? Oh, very well, just because it was yesterday. Yes, the earthquake happens about 18 minutes after uh, 5 in the morning. Most people were asleep, which was a good thing. They were in bed, otherwise we would have had a lot of casualties. The first thing I remember about the earthquake was my mother. She was sitting up in bed, praying to all her favorite saints to save her, because she thought the house was going to collapse. Uh -huh. And when I heard that, I jumped out of my bed and ran to the front of the house, uh, out of the front window. And I could open up the window. And I looked out. And I looked catacorny across the street. And I saw a, a brick building that was just built six months ago a collapse. One ball and then the other went down. And then shortly after that, the wooden structure, which was an old thing, went flat on the ground also. And people who escaped those houses ran out stark naked. There wasn't a stitch of clothing on them. And they went screaming up the street, screaming at the top of their voice. And across the street from us was Foley's Bakery. And I remember all the bakers came out from their cellar work, workshop and were on the sidewalk. Uh -huh. I was in the window. I could see all that. And... Uh, what was the address on the bakery? Where did one... It was 125, 7... And then later changed to 149 7th Street. And the name of the bakery, the bakery was Columbia Bakery. And your father's name? My father's name was the Eberhard, E B E R H A R D, just like the pencil, Eberhard Pencil. Uh -huh. That was Eberhard Christopher? A, a Christopher Eberhard. Van Nagel, S P A N, and then Nagel, L A G E T, spelled with E L. Uh -huh. That's the German spelling. Uh -huh. Did the fire start soon after that? The fire. Um, I, I left that in the cage now. Those two houses collapsed, and in one of the houses that collapsed, collapsed was a little restaurant. And he evidently had been up early and started his coal and wood fire and was getting coffee ready for his early morning train. And it was just at that spot when that little restaurant was that the fire first appeared. Uh-huh. And um, my father sent a young man and he told him to run all the way to 6th Street to get a fireman. 
And the young, young man did, and he returned with the fireman. And I stood right at the hydrant when the fireman coupled the hose and was going to, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, douse the fire, fire with water. And not a drop of water came. And he uncoupled the hose and said, there is no water. And just then, I saw three drops of water splash through the sidewalk. And that was all the water we saw. The main, uh, the main pipe from South San Francisco into San Francisco had broken out in the mission. And all the water that should have been in San Francisco ran into the bay. And here was a city on fire and not a drop of water to put out the fire. Do you remember when they ordered, the militia ordered the, the, the blowing up of buildings to stop the fire? Wait, I didn't quite get the question. Do you remember when the militia ordered the certain buildings to be blown up to stop the fire? Oh, yes. Oh, that was common. Block after block was blown up. Uh -huh. But that didn't stop it. The fire leaped. One block after the other, just one block after the other. Be Until it came to Van Ness Avenue. And uh, Van Ness Avenue was uh, a parade street. It was twice as big as any ordinary street, twice as wide, you see, because they held all the parades and maneuvers on, on Van Ness Avenue. And uh, we all thought that would stop the fire down the avenue. Well, it did, but there was one portion of it where the fire leaped over the avenue and stopped burning the north, uh, uh, the northern part of the city. But they succeeded in getting that out. Uh -huh. Did you leave your home? Did you have to leave? where you were living and go somewhere else to during the, the fire? <laughs> we left our home about, uh, I would say, half past, uh, half past five, quarter to six in the morning. The fire was at the corner, just a few houses away from us, and we had to get out. Uh -huh. Did you go by wagon? Now, wait a minute. Uh, my mother told us to go out to my chum's house. And I said, oh, that's an imposition. I was my sister, I and her two sisters butting in into their home, and I wouldn't do it. Uh -huh. But she did. She went there, and we weren't there. And then my father had to go and find us. Well, he found us. On 8th Street, the fire had stopped at 8th Street. And so he hired a wagon, and we got into it, and he got into it, and they drove his way up to Bernal Heights, to where my mother was at her home. Uh -huh. At her friend's yeah, home. And then we had a suite on the floor. Of course, you know, we were five people. She had five beds, uh, but my mother, uh, but her son was happened to be in Oakland. It was it was Easter vacation when the fire happened. He was over in Oakland to friends of his, and my mother got his bed. She was the lucky one, <laughs> but we slept on the floor, and it was very very hard. My father. I just got tired of sleeping on the floor, and he went over to Oakland. Uh, I think by that time, they let people from Oakland go to San Francisco. At first, nobody could go into San Francisco after the earthquake. They, uh, they stopped all ferry boats and all trains. No one could come in. 
But people could go out. They could. Oh yes, they could go out. Uh huh. What did he do in Oakland then? Uh, about my father. Yes. Uh huh. Oh, as I say, he was. He, he walked a great deal. He looked at all. He went over there, you know, kind of the ferry uh, trip and all that. And we just walked around. No, no, we're talking about after the earthquake, Mother. Your yes, dad, I your, know it. All right. It. All right. All right. <laughs> all right. We, walked, we walked around. My father took us over there then. Well, you bought, you, you rented a house, didn't you, out in the food yeah, trail area? Uh -huh. Yeah. My father looked around over there, and he found a brand new house. No one had ever lived in it. And uh, I think the rent was $65. And uh, my mother saw it. And then she said, wait, I'm going to the furniture store first. And she showed her her bank book, with, and she had $4,000 in cash. And she told the, um, uh, the, uh, what, the, uh, the furniture store that just as soon as the bank opens up, she would pay them. Well, they saw that she had money, and they let her have the furniture. So we moved into this vacant new house, and I had a double bed. My mother got me a beautiful bird's eye maple bedroom set. My sister and I slept in the bed together, and uh, uh, I think my little sister had a cradle, and she slept in our same room also. And then my mother bought a double bed for, for her and my father. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a bureau, each had a bureau in our room and chairs. And then we had tables for the kitchen and a stove for her. Tell us about what happened just after you saw all these things out of the earthquake, the window, out of the window at the earth, time of the earthquake, Mother. Remember, you said you went then down and I you couldn't was, get out of the door. I, um, I ran to the window, as I told you. My mother was sitting up in bed praying to all the saints, her favorite saints, to save us. And then you said she that, that she thought the house was going to collapse. All right. And I got up and put on my suit, shoes and stockings, and I guess a wrapper, we used to call them wrappers. It was a robe I put over my nightgown, and I went out and looked in the window. And I looked across the street, and I saw a, this a brand new building, just six months old, one wall and then the other, and then it collapsed. And next to it was a wooden building. And then that collapsed. Uh -huh. And the women uh, who escaped out of that house were stark naked. And they ran in the street, stark naked, screaming their lungs out. What did you do for them? And I said to myself, my, it was as bad as all this. I better go downstairs. <laughs> That's what I thought. So I went downstairs, our steps were still standing, and I wanted to get out into the sidewalk to my father's bakery, but every door in the whole community was stuck. Everybody was a prisoner in their own home. No door would open. So my, husband, my father was a strong man, and he came and with all his strength, he lifted the door up and it caught in the latch and it opened up. And I was about the first on the street. And the first ones to greet me were these three naked women. And you know what they asked me. <laughs> they asked me for clothing. And I went in to my mother's wardrobe and got her very best clothes. I got three woolen skirts and three woolen jackets. And I came out 
and they put all the skirts over their nakedness. They were stout naked as the jacket. <laughs> and the last thing I saw, they were walking up 7th Street, <laughs> barefoot of the course. <laughs> But they had saved their life. Now, um, then, after that... Well, tell wait. what you saw. You, you got your father's ex. You've told us so many times that, that people were trapped. Oh, yes. Uh, people were trapped in the fallen building. And I went over there to see what was the matter. And I heard the workingmen say, if we only had an X, we could get some of these people out. And I was right there, just a 16-year-old kid, and I piped up, I'll get you an X. And I ran home and got my father's X. It was too heavy for me to carry, but I began to drag it. And they saw me coming with it, and then they took it away from me. And I'm glad to say, they chopped away enough timber to three people, and I saw them get out of the hole and walk away. I have that satisfaction. You saved a lot of people's lives. Well, I don't know mm -hmm. how many, but I, I guess they, I never did it. The axe did it. <laughs> Mother, tell about the, the people who dropped the baby from the window to somebody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right opposite us, was uh, oh, an old-fashioned house with bay windows. And um, there was a father who had an infant in his hand. And there was a man in the street. And he called to the man in the street. And he, wanted, he said, he's going to drop the baby into his arms. And I yelled over to him, don't do it, the earthquake is over. He looked up at me, but he did it anyhow. But I'm glad to say the man in the street caught the infant in his arms, dropped from a high second story window. And uh, did you know if the people got out? I never did hear the end of that story. Did you know if they got out? Oh, yes, I think they did. I think they uh, shut down the doors or something mm -hmm. like that. Those doors in those days were half glass and half wood. Mm -hmm. I think they got in. But every door was stuck. Every door. <laughs> Nobody could get in or out of their house. It was just jammed. But then there was an earthquake, a, another one, an aftershock, about, I think it was a half hour later, or maybe a little longer, and that earthquake adjusted the locks, and the people could get out of their homes. That's what it's Now, uh-huh, and uh, the, the corner below us was on fire already, and we knew we had to get out of there. You have told me, Mother, that the, the, the houses went off their foundations. Oh, uh, yes, some, yes, some of the houses did go off of their foundations. Uh -huh. uh, I don't think ours did. My mother said there was new construction right next to us, and she said that new construction sort of held us up, though she did expect to... Uh, for the house to collapse. Uh -huh. Now, after you moved to Oakland, and you moved into this new house, then did you go back to San Francisco to see later the building, the rebuilding? Well, my father was a baker. He had a bakery. But he's never had a vacation Oh, I guess in 50 years, he kept baking every night. And this is the first time he was there. Hello. Hello. Oh, I said they'd call back. It's all right. We'll just go past that. 
So, it's all right. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, Rod Lisbon. Well, well, we were talking. She was asking if you'd gone back. They they moved back to San Francisco moved, after a little while, right, right, a few right. months. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, just a moment now. Um, How long did you stay out in Fruitvale? Wait a minute. Um, well, I'll tell you what we did. After the fire, my mother said to me, go to my chum's house and I'll meet you there. And I was 16 and I had my two little sisters with me. And I said, oh, what an imposition to go at the bargain to my chum's home. Uh -huh. You but told my, us. My, my, uh -huh. I know, my mother didn't think so. And so we stayed downtown. And my mother, in the meanwhile, had gone up to my chum's home, way out on Bernal Heights, and we weren't there. So my father said, I'll go and look for the children. And he found us on 8th Street. The fire had burned to 8th Street. And if we had just a little water, we could have put it out there. But there was no water. And in one section of 8th Street, it jumped across the street. And then from 8th Street to 20th, it burned. Every house went. You remember telling you, uh, you rem I remember you're telling me, Mother, about the sound that the city hall made when it fell. Oh, remember yes. that? Yes. When the city hall collapsed, as a big stone building, it was a lot of graph to it, you know. It collapsed, and it made a tremendous sound. Yes, that that, that, uh, that sound belongs to the earthquake of collapsing buildings. That is right. That, that, that belongs to the earthquake story. The sound the collapsing buildings made. Uh -huh. How did the earthquake sound when you first heard it? In, in your bed at 5 uh -huh. o'clock in the morning. I, I didn't hear any sound at all, but a great shaking, it took me awake. And the first thing I heard was my mother praying aloud mm -hmm. to save him. She thought, sure, the house was going to fall down. And I got up and put on my stockings and shoes and a, a robe over my nightgown. And I ran to the window. I could open it up. Everything was fine. And I looked across the street and I saw this three-story brick building just newly built six months ago collapsed like a car house. Mrs. Fister? Yeah. Could you explain what San Francisco looked like to you at 15? What, the, before the earthquake? This yes, time? I can tell explain you what, what San what Francisco you think it looked, looked like. like. Yeah. San Francisco was a city of wooden houses. Very few brick houses were there. And at the time of the earthquake, all the brick houses collapsed. <laughs> and if you want to say swear word after the earthquake, say brick house. <laughs> because that went flat. <laughs> and people in those brick houses, they were killed. But the people in the wooden houses were. And we saw the fire coming. And my father sent a young man to 6th Street. We lived on 7th for a fireman to tell him to come quick. And the fireman came, and I stood right by the hydrant where they would get the water, you know, to couple the holes to put the fire out. And three drops of water dropped out. The main supply of water into San Francisco had broken. The pipe was broken, and all the water that was to go to San Francisco, ran into the bay. And here we were, a city on fire, and not a drop of water to put it out. Mother, I'm now, going to give you something else to hold here. Here you are. All right. Remember, you were telling about going to the bank and about 
going down to the um, uh, getting chili tamales tamales before for supper sometime. Oh yeah, so tell us about that. Oh, well, we lived down Seventh Street. My father had the bakery, and we lived in a flat above the bakery. Uh -huh. And we had front windows. I slept in the front bedroom. It was a parlor, but my mother said, never mind. He said the air was so much better in the front than in the back where we get the smell of the baked goods. So at the time of the earthquake, I ran to the front, uh -huh, and I saw the collapsing of the building. And at the meantime, I saw three naked women, stark naked, not one stitch of them, running up 7th Street, screaming at the top of their voice. Uh -huh. And I said, oh, if it's that bad, I'm going down. And I went down, everything stood, but when I wanted to get out of my father's store, I could not. The door was jammed. So just at that time, my father came running into the front from the bakery, where he, in the back of the bakery where he worked. And he was strong, and he gave the door a lift, and it caught, and I could get out. And the first thing who came to me were these three naked women begging me for clothes. Uh -huh. So I went back to my mother's wardrobe and I got her very best clothes and I gave each a woolen skirt and each a jacket to cover up their nakedness. And the last I saw of them was they walked up 7th Street barefooted, but at least they were covered. Uh -huh. That's great. Now tell me about before the earthquake and you, what school did you go to? Did you walk to your school? Oh, sure. What school was it? I went to the Humboldt School. First I went to the Star King, and then I went to the Humboldt, and then I went to Adams, and then I went to Polytechnic High. Did you have to take a, a street car or a horse car to get there? No. <laughs> No, we didn't. We had a walk. Uh -huh. You could walk. We could All walk. Right. Uh -huh. All right, fine. You've told me that often your mother would send you to the bank. Oh, yeah, my mother would send me the bank with the gold. And I have it. Put the gold in the bank for her to deposit it. She, she always How managed old were you? to get gold, huh? How old were you then? Oh, about 14, something like that. All right, fine. Now, Tell me about the clothes that you wore. Remember, you said you always went to school with a with a woolen skirt and a flannel. No, I always. My mother said San Francisco is so cold. We didn't have sweaters in those days; they weren't invented. So, we, I had on a woolen dress, and to protect my dress, my mother made a sort of a calico apron made out of stripes, and I put that over the dress, and that's how I went to school. We didn't wear any coat or anything, we just, that's the way we went. And then, when we came home from school in the afternoon, we had to change our clothes. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd have dirty clothes to go to school, and I wouldn't want that. So we changed our clothes when we came home from school. Did you wear lots of petticoats and things like that? Well, I'll tell you what we did. Uh, my mother always made our panties, and she made them out of the quill. You know, it's fuzzy on one side and smooth on the other. She made our pants out of that. And uh, let's see. And we always wore a woolen petticoat, and, and, and that was enough to go to school. Most, it was a style there when all the girls wore red flannel petticoats. And I had a red flannel petticoat, and I didn't like it. We had some rich girls in my class, and they wore white flannel 
petticoats with lovely embroidery on it, and I wanted that too, but I didn't get it. <laughs> what kind of a hat did you wear? They wore a hat, uh huh, and uh, oh, it was either trimmed with marguerites, all ribbon, uh huh, and a sash hang down in back, and at the end of the sash was sewn a fringe, and that hang, hang down. And on Sunday, my mother, Saturday night, my mother washed her hair, and then she made crimps. She didn't know how to make curls, but she made crimps. And she made about eight or ten little tiny braids, and uh, braided it after washing the hair. And then Sunday morning, she would unbraid those braids and then rub the comb gently through them and we'd have very wavy hair. <laughs> Did you have special Sunday clothes? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, we did. Uh -huh. On Sunday, we bought a petticoat made of white embroidered flannel. Then a flannel was given to us generally as a birthday gift. Eat the yardage, and then it was made up. But it had, uh, oh, about two feet of embroidery on it. You know, huh? Mm -hmm. All done by machinery, of course. Uh -huh. It was machine embroidery. Uh -huh. But very nice. Uh -huh. And did your mother buy that to put on the petticoats at a store? No, that was the manufacturer put that in. I see. Oh, he I bought see. the yardage already embroidered. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. What about your shoes and stockings? Well, we have. My mother, she thought San Francisco was so icy cold, and she put woolen stockings on us. Uh -huh. Oh, my sister Tilly had a fit. She couldn't take it. And every time she had to put on a stocking, there would be a big hassle. Uh -huh. Was it because of the wool or because of the mending in it? No, uh, the wool. Oh, she didn't yeah. like the wool. Uh -huh. But that didn't stop my mother. She had to wear the wool and stuff in. Uh -huh. What were the shoes like? How did they fasten? We had button shoes. Uh -huh. With buttons. High button shoes? Yeah, high button mm -hmm. shoes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Now, uh, my mother had to pay five dollars for her shoes, and we thought that was a terrible lot. <laughs> Were the women in those days able to be in business? Did they? Did any of them go out to work uh, in offices? Uh, well, women in business. Yes, n next to us, uh, a couple houses down, was a Jewish family. And they had a stationery store, and they had four children. And the um, woman ran the stationery store. And I remember one instance, uh, uh, the woman, they gave tickets. And if you get 25 tickets, you got 10 cents worth of goods, you know, free. That's what they did. And I remember one woman came to buy something, and the, this Jewish woman charged the five cents more. Oh, no, she said, I won't pay that. That's too much. It's such and such of the price. And then she, the, woman, uh, the woman who owned the store said, well, all right. <laughs> And I was right there when she flashed nine tickets in front of her. <laughs> so she was giving them food, the stuff for nothing. Uh -huh. Oh, I never forgot that. And then she said, I'm making more than 10 cent purchase. I'll get another ticket. And the woman said, no. Oh, there was quite an argument. <laughs> How did, uh, did you have a dressmaker to make the clothes or did your mother make the clothes? 
So my mother made quite a bit, but we also had a dressmaker. And she was a very good one. Uh -huh. My mother bought nice material, and the dressmaker told her to get the printing. And at the time of the earthquake, when I was 16, I had a very nice, I had two suits of clothes, a best one, and then uh, another one, another tailored suit that I wore to high school. Mm -hmm. You have told me that after the earthquake, when you came back to San Francisco, you went back to school. You wanted to go back to school, yes, uh -huh. but but there was what was a, right. there was a reason uh -huh. why you couldn't. But we came back to San Francisco. The schools had opened, but they were way out opposite the Golden Gate Park, too far to walk from Venice Avenue. And uh, the morning I was all ready to go to school again, to high school, when, when there was a car strike. And the carman said, we were going to win this strike even if the streets had the blood, blood red with blood. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to take a streetcar with a men parked like that. <laughs> <laughs> way out there. So I went and I walked down a few blocks and there was a millinery school and I went to it and I learned a little millinery. <laughs> but I told them I was going to work as a milliner and I got a job as a milliner. But they wouldn't let you do anything. They let you line a hat and that, and that's all. And most of all, you had to go deliver hats. And I didn't like that. <laughs> so I quit. I quit. Um, and I thought to myself, if you wanted to be a milliner, you should have an aunt or a big sister or something like that to teach you because the milliners are not going to teach you. Okay, now there was one, uh, the ladies would like to hear about your experiences in Golden Gate Park, and I also want you to tell them about the wooden sidewalks and the buttons, all the buttons you played. Uh, all right. Well, I'll tell you about the wooden sidewalks. There wasn't a cement sidewalk in the city of San Francisco. Everything was wooden planks. And people kept dropping coins on the sidewalk and they rolled down the cracks. But the landlord was not obliged to open up the sidewalk unless the people lost a dollar. Then he was obliged to open up the sidewalk that they could get their dollar back. And so, Whenever a sidewalk was to be repaired, we watched. And as soon as the workmen had lifted the plank, about a half a dozen kids jumped into the opening and went scrounging around in the sand. And we were never disappointed. We always came up with some coin because if a person got the coin, it was lost. We used to take chewing gum on the stick and we would get a hold of a coin and get it up but at last it wasn't uh, in the same position as the slot it was opposite and it would drop to the floor again <laughs> i don't think we succeeded in getting one coin up <laughs> they all dropped back <laughs> but if there was a repair being made oh you could see the kids